It's now my pleasure to introduce the next panel. Meet Johan Rockström, the internationally recognized scientist on global sustainability issues who led development of the planetary boundaries. He's currently a professor in Earth System Science at the University of Potsdam and a director of the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research. It's, it's great to have you with us here, uh, Johan Rockström. Please share your insights with us. Thank you so much and let me then share screen as well and uh, do it uh, like this. Okay, there we are. So hello everyone and um, great to be with you in this uh, exponential discussion. What I'll do is uh, just over the next uh, uh, 10, 15 minutes, just try to scientifically frame the justification for everything that you want, Falcon, what you've been discussing during the course of the day here. And let me start that framing by something that I think have excited all of us over the next last few days, with uh, Europe taking the world lead on the exponential transformation by locking itself through a legal framework to 55% emission reductions by 2030. But I think even more uh, significant potentially with uh, Xi Jinping's announcement yesterday in UNGA of uh, carbon neutrality latest 2060 and peaking no later than 2030. Here we have uh, two giant regions committing towards what must translate into exponential, tri exponential roadmaps. And of course, the only thing we're waiting for now is what happens on the 4th of November in the US. And uh, if that transition would occur as well, then of course we can really start talking of turning a corner to start really scaling and implementing exactly what you've been discussing throughout the day. Now, the necessity of this is the focus of this talk. And I don't need to kind of emphasize for, for this group that we are in the Anthropocene, a reminder that even the COVID-19 is a manifestation of the scale and speed of the hyper-connected world we live in. We don't have like one isolated health crisis. We have an interconnected climate crisis with the health crisis, with the ecosystem crisis. We know this from scientific evidence that COVID-19 is a zoonotic viral spillover from wildlife, potentially by domestic animals to humans that this only occurs because of unsustainable human penetration into natural habitats, risky handling of wet markets and wildlife trade, which then can propel itself towards a global disaster through an hyperconnected world. So what happens in one corner of the planet can send immediate crisis shockwaves across the whole world, just like undermining the global commons that regulates the stability of the climate system can send in voices if we let ecosystems collapse, ice sheets irreversibly melt, or the ocean heat circulation be destabilized. So we're now in a, in a completely new juncture, giving new scientific support, or let's say we emphasizing the support for exponential roadmaps. I think it's quite interesting how the BBC yesterday showed in the global opinion poll that people understand this. They even understand that climate change as, is as as serious as the coronavirus. Just look at the global numbers. 71% agree to the statement that climate change is as serious as the corona crisis. And the corona crisis is the most devastating shock to the global economy since the 1930s. We've seen global emissions reduce at a pace which aligns with the carbon law of cutting emissions by half every decade. Nothing to celebrate because we can under no circumstances save the planet by ruining human uh, economy and, and, um, and jobs. But on the other hand, it just shows the magnitude of change we're facing. And this is incredibly important for us to recognize. It is a transformative moment. The impacts we're seeing across the world already at a 1.2 degrees Celsius warming. I don't have to remind you about this. 
just to share with you the nervousness that is uh, eating itself deeper and deeper into the scientific fabric. 38 degrees Celsius measured this summer in Siberia with forest fires in the Arctic, with permafrost carbon um, fluxes occurring in abrupt levels that we had not expected. So these are changes that are happening faster than scientific uh, assessments have been able to assess previously. Just a few weeks back, you have the United in Science second issue coming out from the IPCC and the World Meteorological Organization. Look at the orange wedge there. 2016 to 2020, set to be the warmest five-year period on record. Now, we know that the last 20 years have the 19 warmest years on record. Why is it the 20 out of 20? Because 1998 is just outside of that 20 period, the warmest, most amplified El Nino year ever, which knocked over 30 or 40 percent in some regions of tropical coral reefs to permanent, uh, permanent collapse. Now, this is starting to cause also nervousness and impacts outside of the environmental or let's say health core spheres. You have certainly followed many of these uh, increasing evidence that global warming and ecosystem change is having amplified impacts on social instability, meaning that what happens in, in Chad, in Niger, in Mali, in the Arab Spring, in Syria, in Sudan, has today so strong couplings with global warming that we can no longer detangle uh, conflict, displacement and migration from our destabilization of environmental systems at regional and global scale. So it's not a surprise that we have over 100 countries and regions having declared a state of climate emergency. It is dramatic that science now suggests that we may have to consider declaring a state of planetary emergency, that we're transgressing so many planetary boundaries that we are putting ourselves at risk of destabilizing the Earth system. You might ask yourself, isn't this exaggerating the assessment? Well, let me give you just two pieces of evidence to kind of uh, justify this, this drama. And here's one of them. This is the first time ever a, a climate model is able to reproduce the temperature on Earth over the last 3 million years. So that's what you see on the x-axis here, the last 3 million years. On the y-axis is the deviation from global mean temperature at the pre-industrial average of 14 degrees Celsius, the zero point there. What this shows is that the Earth's temperature has never exceeded 2 degrees Celsius over the past 3 million years. This is incredibly important information, but it's also quite humbling. The Earth system, despite all the you know, variations of solar influx of heat, and volcanic eruptions, earthquakes, all the natural you know, pressure points taking us in and out of ice ages and into glacials, despite this, the Earth system has been able to self-regulate itself thanks to its biophysical interactions within a very narrow band plus two, the warmest point, minus four, deep ice age, oscillating like this for the past three million years. Now we're on a journey that will take us crashing through that two degrees Celsius point in just you know 20 to 30 years time if we continue burning fossil fuels as today and can take us to over three and a half degrees Celsius by the end of this century, a point we haven't seen for the past five to 10 million years. Isn't that enough? For us to act, I would say just this graph on its own, in my mind, puts everything aside and tells us exponential transitions is an absolute necessity. This is coupled by our latest assessment of what is happening with the planet. We have in November 2019, just before COVID-19, the, the publication of the latest mapping of the system that may shift from stable, self-cooling systems tipping over to potentially self-amplifying warming systems. Here is the mapping of the nine of the known 15 so-called tipping elements that are showing signs to be on the move. And not that they are at a tipping point, but they show uh, concerning signs of either slowdown or increased variability that can take them closer to tipping points. As you see here, we have the West Antarctic ice shelf, 
the Arctic and the coral reef systems that very likely already have crossed. But you also see the Amazon rainforest and the Atlantic circulation and heat that are showing worrying signs of being at a position, for example, where the North Atlantic Gulf Stream has slowed down by 15%, and that these are interconnected. This gives us even more support that we've truly entered what we call the decisive decade for humanity's future on Earth, that now is the time to bend the curves to start the transition towards a decarbonized, carbon neutral, sustainable future for humanity within a safe and just operating space on Earth. This is truly an exciting moment also in terms of this being starting to sink in. And we have you know, everything from uh, the BlackRock announcement recently on sustainability shifts in investments, but also two days ago, Walmart's pledge to go net zero by 2040 across all its scope one, two, and three. Jeff Bezos' 10 billion uh, you know, investment in climate action. And of course, the exponential roadmaps own initiatives of really ramping up the number of companies that are adopting the carbon law. So we are at a point that things are starting to really happen, but we're running out of time. Together with Jeff Sachs and the Sustainable Development Solutions Network, we have tried to translate all the science into the transformative pathways we need to follow. You recognize these, I won't go through them in detail, but just to, you know, you know, kind of remind us that the transport sector is one of the key sectors to be able to unleash the, the necessary solutions for farming systems, for urban development, for education, for health, transport, particularly heavy transport, is, is the artery that keeps our societies functioning, is it's connected to every value chain in every sector along all the transformations towards sustainable development goals. So if we are truly going to follow the IPCC trajectory of bending the curve 2020, the point you see here on the edge of the green starting point, and have a decarbonized world economy by 2050 to have a 66% chance of staying well below two, then that is an exponential roadmap. And as Yuan Falk has probably already mentioned several times, we have been presenting now twice, and now the third version of the exponential roadmap to 2030, putting forward the evidence that we sector by sector can cut emissions by half. And Yuan has just showed the wedges on the transport sector. And, and this is really exciting. And then Henrik Henriksson is with us from Scania, one of the grand champions in the world you know, really emphasizing that we have technologies, several wedges, even in the heavy transport sector, one of the difficult abatement sectors in the world, where currently we can even, if I may cite you, Henrik, uh, start showing evidence that there's no contradiction between profitability and sustainability, even in the heavy transport sector. This is challenging, though. The European Union looks like this, according to ASEA, the the network organization for both private and heavy vehicles in the European Union. And I mean, it's a, it's a sobering reminder that 98.3% of current trucks on the roads are, are, are diesel driven combustion engine. I mean, that is something we have to remember that this is the reality. It is a truly transformative moment. The European Union through the Moedas report did, as you know, quite recently show that there are technologies in place that can take us towards a decarbonization of the entire full transport sector. But this was, will require tremendous investments in technologies, research and development, infrastructure, and we need the policies in place for this. And let me just kind of round off with that, that we, we find at the Potsdam Institute through our climate economics research that one necessity in the whole regulatory framework is, is to have a carbon price in place and a carbon price that we can today calculate more and more precisely when factoring not only environmental costs, but also social costs of carbon. And that the level needs to be at least 50 euros per ton of carbon dioxide to increase up to the level of something like 130 euros per ton of carbon dioxide in the next 10 years to then aim on the long term towards 200 and even above. Now, this might sound like big numbers, but even ASEA, and, and Henrik may be referring back to that, has itself said that it may commit itself in the transport sector to a carbon price of 250 euros per ton of carbon dioxide to be able to you know, create the right incentives of the market for investments in, 
in hydrogen and fuel cell driven heavy transport and, and electrification infrastructure across the European market. I mean, this is just showing how business and science is coming together on, on the trajectory. This is just work that, that UN probably has already referred to that we see you know, trends on electrification, which are starting to show exponential S-curve behavior. It's only the, the full lines here that are the empirical evidence so far. They look very straight, but they are in fact following exponential trajectories. This is not a very clear graph, but it's the International Energy Agency statistics on the European uh, rise, uh, no, the global rise on electric vehicles in the world, which is already today following an exponential curve. So we see the beginnings of an exponential journey on, on decarbonizing at least the electric passenger vehicle fleet, and that this is approaching the knee where we can start seeing uh, major, you know, scaling of, of these technologies. But overall, we're looking at a vast, broad portfolio from, from well to wheel integrated system change. And the question is, how can we unleash that to scale? And I look forward to that panel discussion together in this, uh, in this session. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Johan Rockström. Um, and thank you for also painting initially the global, the planetary picture, even if it is dark and at some points even gloomy. But it's important for us to understand the baseline of, of the, what's happening. Um, most of you, the viewers here, uh, recognize and know that you are Swedish, even if you work in, in the, the Potsdam Institute in Berlin now. And in Sweden, there is um, there is a big topic here on on, on fuels. Uh, the Swedish government is yet to decide whether or not to allow the uh, the expansion of uh, oil refinery. Uh, they're called Primraf. Um, Prim has the ambition to to uh, produce the fuels in a more uh, environmentally efficient way, uh, but it's still fossil based. What, as a scientist, is your take on this? It's a question to me. Yes. So you want to put me into the debate on Prim, Lisa Sheed and Sweden? Okay. <laughs> Um, we know that you yeah. have opinions on this, so we couldn't resist the chance. <laughs> well, you see, the, the, the situation is, is in a way quite simple, but it's very sensitive in the Swedish political debate. The simplicity is the following. We need to decarbonize the world economy in the next 30 years, which means that we have a finite global carbon budget and that global carbon budget to reach 1.5 is only 320 gigatons of carbon dioxide. Divide that by 40, it gives us eight more years to emit at the level that we're doing today. This is a finite number that has to be distributed across all nations in the world. Now, the European Union is moving ahead very fast. Sweden is moving ahead very fast. We can do more efficient um, you know, refineries, than many other parts of the world. But because the whole world needs to now move decisively towards decarbonizing every sector at every time step, then of course, in that context, there is no room for any massive investment in fossil fuel-based infrastructure anywhere in the world. So in that sense, it rules out Prim and it uh, violates Sweden's uh, legally binding commitments to the Paris Climate Agreement. Now, so that, that's the kind of the scientific simple stance. Then it's, of course, a, a more difficult stance when you talk about the European emission trading scheme and will Europe really reduce the cap of allowable emission uh, trading uh, credits and, and will the world truly you know, commit itself to, to follow this path that science says is necessary? And if it doesn't, then, of course, you could argue that, that Prem is doing less bad than others will be doing. So I can understand these arguments, but but scientifically they do not hold. Thank you for your uh, for your input, Johan Rockström. And now let's introduce the first panelist. Meet Henrik Henriksson, president and CEO of Scania, a global leader in the heavy duty transport industry, which is a major contributor to worldwide CO2 emissions. Scania has taken a lead role in shifting the industry to sustainability by getting reduction targets aligned with the 1.5 degree goals. 
More than 95% of Skåne's climate impact comes from where their products are in use. They have a different journey ahead of them, and they are ready to take it. Hello, Henrik Hedrickson. Welcome to the broadcast. Uh, as we saw in the film, you, you, you just launched a fully electric uh, truck. And uh, what role do you see battery electric vehicles play in the transition to a fossil fuel transport sector? Yeah, I think right here, right now, uh, coming back to the 98.3% of, of diesel trucks that are used, uh, that you are referred to, uh, the best thing we can do is, of course, to transform that fossil fuel into biodiesel or, or in the gas vehicles, biogas vehicles. That is the best way if that fuel is produced in a sustainable way to get a great impact and bend to the curve uh, that you want us into uh, in the impact of uh, our emissions. But uh, in addition to the biofuels, I think here and now we are starting to come to a tipping point where electrification starts to make sense for our customers and where we are starting to get the first signs of infrastructure. And that is the reason why we're rolling out these electrical vehicles that are mainly used for, for urban transportation. Uh, and of course, they will be the backbone of our uh, zero emission uh, vehicle transformation for the coming 15, 20 years. Uh, and together with the biofuels as a um, fundamental uh, sort of to transformation of the existing fleet, <clears throat> and maybe in the future also hydrogen and fuel cells, uh, I would say that electrification is the real backbone. But we need infrastructure to make that happen. We need investments, and that is not in charging poles. It is actually in the basic grid and uh, that uh, not only in Europe, but in many parts of the world is missing for us to charge these massive big trucks and buses that requires not a small cable, but a gigantic cable to, to make it work. And those decisions we need to, to make this happen. Well, thank you very much, Henrik. Uh, the next speaker is actually in the room. Let's see his introduction. Meet Robert Falk, an engineer dissatisfied with the sustainability and autonomy of freight solutions. He founded Enride in 2016 with a vision to revolutionize transport. His team at Enride developed the Pod, the first driverless electric freight vehicle in the world to operate on public roads. Using an intelligent freight mobility platform and the power of digitalization, they're creating a sustainable, affordable and fast freight alternative. Hello, Robert. Nice Hi. to have you here with us at the studio. Uh, you've been very brave and very early with your inventions uh, for the Einride pod. Uh, what major roadblocks have you encountered and what major roadblocks needs to be removed for the electrification uh, in, 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 from your perspective? Um, we started Enride with a perception to really drive this change. Uh, I come from the automotive industry and the production of heavy engines. and. We founded the company because it wasn't changing fast enough. New technology really enables us to tackle this challenge in a completely new way. And with doing so, we can also challenge the existing industry and the existing structures to drive that change themselves as well. Well, thank you very much, Robert. I'll be back to you with, with more panel uh, discussions in, a, in just in a few minutes. Let's now introduce the next panelist. Bertrand Picard is the initiator and visionary behind Solar Impulse, the first airplane that flew around the globe powered by the sun. In 2021 he will deliver 1,000 sustainable solutions he selected to decision makers, encouraging them to adopt more ambitious environmental targets and energy policies. Hello Bertrand, nice to see you again. Uh, Bertrand, in your collection of the 1,000 sustainable uh, solutions, I think we're lagging a bit. Let's, let's, let's get a stable connection. Can you hear me now, Bertrand? Yes, I hear you. Excellent, Absolutely. excellent. Yes. Oh, great. And so in your collection of the 1,000 sustainable solutions, in the, the transport perspective, which ones are your favorites? The favorite are all the ones who allow to be more energy efficient. Because the big problem of our world until now is that it's a world of waste. 75% uh, of the energy that is used in transport is just lost. So we have, for example, labeled the software to reduce 2.5% of its fuel just by adapting better routes and better methodology. There is a system that allows ships to be fed by electricity in the harbors instead of letting their engines run. There is another solution, it's called WeNow, 
which is a system that allows a car to always inform the driver of how to be more performant when he drives. You know, these are just three of them, but you, you can add hundreds of them, like the retrofits of uh, gasoline cars into electric cars, uh, ways to be much more efficient in uh, every, every field. And basically, you know, digitalization in that sense does not become a goal in itself. It is just a service that is given to the consumer in order to use less energy to be more efficient. And this is what creates jobs. So this is how to make it much more profitable and attract maybe much more people into that field because they earn money and they create jobs. Thank you very much, Bertrand. Let's move back to Johan Rockström and add all the other panelists to the discussion. Johan, you have now listened to the introduction of you met Hendrik before, and I'm sure you actually met Bertrand too in, in some occasion and Robert. So what questions do you have to the uh, gentlemen here on this on this panel? Well, yes, yes. Hello, and um, it's great to, to be with you. And hello, Bertrand. Or something like that. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think the a question that I that I would be you know interested in, in discussing with us together is is really so we have ten years to cut emissions by half uh, so we have to you know go from from piloting to to scaling um, we have barely even even the possibility of failing we really need to now decisively uh, move the dial very significantly in the next ten years but just like Henrik says. 10 years is too short time to, to find the big breakthrough innovations like, for example, uh, Bertrand, electric aviation or, or electrified heavy vehicles. So there has to be a, a kind of a double path here somehow. And I just wonder, perhaps to you, Henrik, first, how do you see that, that segue of different steps towards, uh, towards the, the desired outcome, which is 100% decarbonization? Thank you, Yuan. Yeah, no, I think that um, if we look at uh, really bending the curve and, and having an impact, um, I think it is to, to work, uh, first of all, with the rolling fleet, uh, the heavy transport, they use the vehicles for 10, 15 years. So to get an impact, we need to get into that fleet. And that we do by uh, turning over from fossil fuels, fossil diesel to uh, uh, biodiesel, uh, HVO, biogas that is produced in a sustainable way. And if we do that in a sustainable way, we reduce CO2 emissions with 90 to 95 percent. Then it's about uh, transforming then the future sales of vehicles to be electrical. And I think the technology is it's mature. What we're missing there is that we have charging infrastructure in big scale um, uh, and um, that we need both at the depots of, of, uh, of our transport companies, but we also need it along the highway systems. and. And, and that infrastructure can, of course, be shared, at least the backbone infrastructure together with the passenger cars transformation as well. Uh, then we need, uh, we have long lead times to make those decisions. In Europe, it's usually between eight to 12 years to, to get a project like that going for a new sort of power line. Uh, so then we need a um, fast decision, a Marshall plan uh, for our, from our politicians to make that happen. Uh, then, then I think we have that to, to transform ourselves the, the, the coming, uh, uh, sort of um, basically from now until 2030 and then maybe at the at the end of this window we will have then uh, hydrogen or maybe other technology but you know I'm getting fed up with with uh, us sometimes focusing on that silver bullet that might come in the future we have to work with what we have here and now and, and focus on that together and, and that's where I think electrification is now coming into play but let's not forget our, our biofuels uh, there. Thank you, Hendrik. Uh, reflections from Bertrand or uh, Robert uh, on this question from Johan? Yes, you know, what is really blocking the system is the fact that all the regulation today are based on the technologies of yesterday and not on the technologies of today, which means that it is much too uh, laid back. Today, it is legal to pollute almost as much as you want. So you have so many companies who say, what I do is legal. Why should I change? Why should I do better? So what we really need to obtain is a modernization of the regulation. And I just give you a short example. The best way to make an electric car profitable for the user is to be able to allow him to sell the electricity of his battery on the grid when there is a peak of consumption. That would be able, that would allow to stabilize the grid in a perfect way, 
and allow the uh, owner of the car to make some money to pay for his battery. But it's not legal. A lot of countries still have a monopoly that prevents the users to put back their energy on the grid, even if it is for their own house. So, so you see, there are so many obstacles in the legal system that we should really be able to work on that. Thank you, Bertrand. Robert, I'm sure you have experienced some legislation that is more for the older techniques than uh, the one you are trying to, to pursue. I think that's an excellent point, and I think that one of the main conclusions we've done since so we started is how deeply so I stuck we are the existing system. I think that the very common is that you ask the existing people that also make the money from the existing system how the future will look like. And I think that the new technology and really the maturity of technology is really at the bridging point where you can actually start, for real start to change how it looks like. And I can't agree more with uh, Picard here that we now need more of a neutral legislation and look at it from the distance. And I think that the politicians have the very difficult task to look at it from a competitive, non-competitive um, perspective and say, okay, now we're going to change. But we're not going to take into consideration business uh, interest from the existing industry. And I normally say that we just want to have equal opportunities mm -hmm. because this technology is changing. And I think that uh, we have to consider the fact that a lot of people are making a lot of money on the existing system, but we need to start to change and make money out of a new system. And the only way to do that is if the politicians do not use legislation to uphold the existing system. And I think that Picard has an excellent point that there's so many things that we see that are upholding the existing system more than anything else. Thank you very much, Robert Falk. Uh, let's see what questions we have from the viewers and bring in Nick Nuttall. Yeah, thanks very much, Katerina. Uh, nice to see all the panelists here as well. Um, this is one to Johan Rockström, which is that you've laid out, hello, Bertrand, you've laid out all the, uh, the big issues there. Why is it so hard in your perspective that policymakers can't just simply take this reality and act with the urgency that, in a sense, actually, many of the companies here are? Yeah, that, that's, uh, that's a very good question. Hello, Nick. Thank, thanks for that. And uh, a very big question. So, so of course, there, there are many factors here that, that can explain the inertia and the inability of the political or the policy arena to, to act in line with the scientific necessity. And, and let me just take one because it's changing so fast right now. We have, over the last 50 years, been stuck in, in, a, in a policy position where environmental problems have been associated with different levels of sacrifice or, or need to be willing to pay more or that we have to you know, set regulations that, that are perceived as if they hamper economic development. We can just see the US situation right now that still lives in this 1970s perspective that, you know, get rid of regulations and, and we kind of promote better, better jobs and business and economic growth. That story has to once and for all die. And it is dying very fast. I mean, we're seeing right now this, this changing face of sustainability from being an environmental story to being the story of prosperity, the story of equity, the story of security, the story of health. And I think that is the, the you know, the, the profitability angle is so fundamental to see grid parity of renewable energy systems with fossil fuel driven electricity, for example. So I think what, what Bertrand and, and, and Henrik and, and Robert represents here is this new story of sustainability being the entry point of success. And the policy arena is is quite frankly not keeping pace here. They're lagging slightly behind. And just to close, perhaps we cannot blame them in full because if I'm to be a little bit critical to, to actors like, like, um, like you, Henrik, from business, you have for a very long time not been so vocal in the public domain. It's been difficult to, to, to hear the voices of uh, what we call keystone actors in different business sectors saying that, hey, can we please get the policy framework in place so we can really scale the technologies that we can deliver, we can deliver now. And, um, and we're in a very exciting point for, for that right now. So, but that's just one, 
uh, piece of, of that very important question. Let's let Hedrick reflect on, on, yeah. on what Joan just said. Oh, but I agree with you, and I think that we, we have been, uh, um, as uh, I think we've been relying a lot of industry associations to, to, to have the interface to the poli policy arena. And, and I think that they have basically played out their role. I think if you want to create change, uh, then, then you cannot uh, belong to a gang which uh, sort of uh, um, huddles around the, the most, or the, the least common denominator. So I think you need to work outside these uh, industry associations with unexpected alliances that cuts through different sort of value chains, where you look at the ones buying the transport, the one that is uh, doing the transport. And, and I think that's when you start thinking outside the box and, and then voice that, uh, that opinion. So, uh, uh, that that's what needs to happen, and, and uh, that's when I think the policymakers will, will listen as well. I mean, then you don't speak about your own old sort of sick mother. You, you, you like we say in Sweden, you, you you actually try to look at it more holistic. So, and that's I think also where digitalization can come in in a very good way, where you, you before maybe you were limited to your own sort of vertical as an industry, but now with digitalization it opens up a completely new way of of, of finding ways that Bertrand was into. Uh, there is a lot of waste in these systems and, and they can be found with digitalization. Mm -hmm. And Baton is searching for the waste with his solutions. And Robert, you wanted to come in with a with a uh, reflection. Uh, yes, you have to compliment uh, Henriksson. It's uh, extremely brave to stick out and actually change say that change is possible. And I think that's some the reflection and why we, for instance, why we started Enride was that even inside the industry, there was a so strong force and there was literally not invited to the gentlemen's club of the automotive industry, if you 10 years ago said that the future is electric and battery. And that was this is very tough to break. And I think that we need more people that said that we need to change, we need to work for that change and coming from different perspectives, but united in the belief that we have to change. But that takes bravery. And I think it also, we need to help and support, and that's what really love why, why we do things like this, is we need to encourage the people to actually make this change happen, because it's hard. Thank you, Robert. So, uh, two quick questions. It's kind of to everybody, um, and you don't all have to answer, but it would be nice if at least one person did. Hydrogen. Everyone's now talking about hydrogen, yeah? Um, I mean, I remember hydrogen being discussed some years ago, but suddenly everyone's wild about hydrogen. What is, what is happening here and what does it mean to you? And the last question is, how do we ensure that all these wonderful technologies that you're developing at Scania, at MRIDE, all the solutions you've got as well coming along, Bertrand, how do we ensure that the developing world also gets the benefit of these? Because we know in the past, every time Europe improved the emission standards of motor cars, they just kicked them all to Dubai and then they shipped them down to Africa so they could take our obsolete technologies. How do we leapfrog? That's if the last question. It's an important one. Yes. If we speak about hydrogen, we should stop saying that hydrogen is the future. <laughs> hydrogen is the present. And today we know very well how to make hydrogen that is completely clean with hydrolysis of water through renewable energies. And Switzerland has a program today that does not need any subsidies from any government. They have put together the supermarkets of Switzerland, even the one competing against each other. They took the gas stations, even the one competing against each other. There is a producer of hydrogen that makes clean hydrogen, and they brought 1,000 trucks from Hyundai uh, that are coming in the next two years from South Korea. The first trucks already arrived, and today you can cross Switzerland with gas stations producing and distributing hydrogen. And for 100 kilometers, you do it at the same price that if you buy diesel. And this has been done without any support of the government. It can be reproduced everywhere. So we really have to, to understand that the future is already today and that we have to move because otherwise we're going to miss the train. Thank you, Bertrand. I think we'd like to have just a touch on the question on the, that you framed, Nick, on the on the, the developing countries not to dump the the uh, the technologies ob obsolete. Yeah, yes, leapfrog in a sense, mm -hmm. so that they get this quickly as well. Is that possible with the technologies 
you have Scania M right? Uh, I think it's very interesting when it comes yes, to hydrogen to quickly comment on it. I think that hydrogen is not very suitable for heavy transport. Uh, I think that uh, I'm very worried about how the blowback for that implementation of the technology is uh, even if it's the safest applications given on scale, there will be what I perceive be accidents and it's highly volatile it's, as nature. We did a lot of tests and trials in my previous deploy on that setup. And uh, the key question was always who goes up to the truck to check if something's not working. And uh, for me, my perspective, that's uh, on certain applications that feels they believe definitely for energy storage, I think it would be great. And certain applications, sure, but mass scaling, I think that electric and battery is really at the point of maturity from technology to industrialize that you can really scale that technology. So I think that will change. And that's also the potential for Africa and uh, all the different developing regions is that Solar cells, batteries, and electric will be the cheapest alternatives in a very close future. And what we need to help them with is the industrial power to make this transition happen, rather than just sell old technology. Thank you, Robert. We need to, to wrap yep. this up and move to the next segment. Thank you very much, Johan Rockström, Henrik Henriksson, and Bertrand Picard and Robert Falk for sharing your insights in this segment, important segment on transportation. And Nick, thank you. Thank you.